It was all my fault. It had almost cost Felicia and I our lives. Our friend Sandy was having a house party, and we both wanted to go. Sandy threw the best parties, and they usually got pretty wild. The last one had been a real blowout, and we both had a little more than foggy memories from it. Sandy was celebrating her graduation from nursing school, so we all knew this one was going to be a serious rager before she had to settle in to pay student loans. Before we went, Felicia and I agreed that one of us needed to stay sober so we could get home safely. We don't want a repeat of last time, Felicia reminded me, and I nodded as I remembered how the Uber driver had tried to hold us captive until we agreed to invite him in. Running in heels is never fun, but we had managed it that night and beat him to the door of our apartment. So, we did rock, paper, scissors for it. Went 10 out of 10, and I ended up with the loss. I wasn't happy about it, but I decided that I would do my best to stay sober so we could get home without having to A, get rides from creepy handsy guys, B, get murdered by a stranger, or C, have to take a cab that neither of us could afford. We pulled up to the party, the party already in full swing, and I took a deep breath as I prepared to say no to temptation and be the best sober friend I could be. I lasted all of an hour before I just couldn't hold out anymore. Someone handed me a drink, didn't even ask, and I drank it before I could think better of it. It was one of the very tasty screwdrivers that were going around, so I decided then and there that this would be my only one. I could still hold out. One drink wasn't going to get me. An hour after that, I was completely plastered. Felicia was not pleased when she found me. She had decided to go all in, so now both of us were drunk and had no clue how we were going to get home. We took one look at each other, laughed, and said screw it. We drank way more than we should have that night and had a blast. We danced, we drank, and we mingled our way through the party. And when Sandy waved us out around 2 a.m., we were basically holding each other up. I staggered to the car, but I couldn't even get my key in the door to unlock it, let alone drive. Felicia and I decided that we would just walk home. It was seven blocks from Sandy's house, but we had no chance of getting a cab this late, and the Ubers would be all weirdos at this point. Felicia agreed, but was basically dead weight after three steps. She was ready to sleep and certainly wasn't interested in walking seven blocks. I was holding her up, looking for options as my own buzz wavered when I saw a yellow cab parked at the corner. I got excited. It was a little late for cabs, but I wasn't about to question Providence. The light was still on, the guy in the front seat looking pretty awake, and I thought our luck might be turning around as we staggered towards him. I knocked on the window, and the guy with the red hair snug down under a driving cap jumped as he turned to look at me. He was a big guy, big with fat instead of muscle, and he looked surprised but also delighted as he rolled the window down. He asked how he could help us, and I told him we needed a lift. He asked where we were going, and after telling him the address, I offered to give him a nice big tip if he got us there safely, with no weirdness. Yes, ma'am, I believe I can manage that, he said with a big smile. Hop in. So we piled in the back, he turned off his light, and off we went. Felicia was asleep about the time we made the first turn, but I decided to stay awake to make sure the driver didn't try any funny business. We were from a pretty big city, and girls had been going missing pretty regularly lately. You read about it on Facebook all the time. They go out, get a little drunk, and then they're never seen again. No one really knew what it was, but a lot of people thought it was a murderer. It was scary to think about, but I felt a little safer being in a real cab rather than an Uber with some random guy. You never quite knew what the vetting process was on Uber, but I knew the cab companies had to do background checks on their drivers, so at least this fellow was on the up and up. You ladies coming from a club? He asked, making small talk as he took his first left. 
a house party, I said, trying to be polite. Our friend was throwing a real heck of a get-together, and we partied a little too hard, I think. Sounds like fun. Looks like your friend had a little too much, though. Yeah, she does that sometimes. I was supposed to stay sober so I could drive us home, but I'm not very good at it. Well, I guess it's a good thing for me, then. I made a non-committal noise and settled back. There was a little holder on the partition with waters in it, and when I reached for one, I saw the cabbie turn to track my movements. He seemed interested in what I was doing, and I held up one of the waters and said one of his fares must have left it behind. It was a shame because my stomach was a little too full of alcohol, and some water would have been really nice. Oh, those are for my fares. I have a bunch in the cooler in here. I replace them as needed. Help yourself. I thanked him, testing the seal to make sure that it was still sealed. It seemed to be, but I never got it open. The feel of the wheels beneath me was lulling me to sleep, and I was losing the fight. I tried to stay awake, but I was just too drunk. My eyes kept slipping shut and opening, slipping shut and opening, and as I threatened to go under for good, I heard the cabbie's phone ring. He picked it up, talking to someone, and it was like his whole demeanor changed. There was a very different voice than I was used to. Gone was the jovial guy who had picked us up, and now he was gruff and kind of short with whoever he was talking to. It seemed like a complete flip in personality. Yeah, I got him. We'll be there soon. I started to ask what he meant by that, but before I could question the statement, I was unconscious. I don't know how long we were out for, but I woke up suddenly, unsure of where we were. I looked around, groggy and disoriented. Felicia was still sleeping beside me, dead to the world and not showing any signs of coming back, and the cabbie was still behind the wheel and driving us home. At least, I thought he was. I glanced out the window, no longer seeing tall buildings and concrete, and I thought he must have taken a wrong turn. We were in the country, the buildings traded for rural pavement and shadowy houses. Everything was dark outside, no street lights this far out in the country, and I just watched it whiz by for a moment as I tried to make sense of it. I was confused, not sure how we had gotten so lost. Then I remembered the conversation before we passed out. Yeah, I got him. We'll see you soon. Even in my drink-addled brain, I remembered those words. I glanced at the numbers on the dashboard clock and was surprised to see that we had been in the cab for over an hour. It shouldn't have taken that long to get home. Seven blocks would have been an easy drive this late at night. And as I tried to sit up, I felt something press against my wrist. The unopened water was a cool pressure against my arm. I didn't remember opening it and realized I must have fallen asleep before I could drink it. My vision swam as I tried to come upright and I blinked quickly to clear it. Where? I tried, but my throat was dry. Where are we? The cabbie jumped a little, probably figuring I'd passed out like my friend, and when he looked over his shoulder, I heard again the voice of that happy cabbie who had picked us up again. We're driving to your home. I tried to make his words make sense, but it was like wading through mush. This isn't right. I live in the city. You told me 175 Worth Street, he said, tapping his phone and the holder on the dash. No, I slurred, trying to make my head stop spinning. It was 751 Worthy Street. We were... I put a hand to my mouth as hot vomit threatened to come coursing up. We were only seven blocks from our house. He put a theatrical hand to his brow. Oh my gosh, I guess I put the address in wrong. Let me just find a place to turn around and we'll get you back on track. He started tapping at his phone, but I could see he wasn't hitting anything. I was suddenly wary, 
some of my intoxication ebbing away as he put on a show of trying to get the address right. I remembered those stories about the girls that had gone missing, and I wondered if our names and faces would be on the news tomorrow. Would they think we just wandered off after drinking too much? Would they even look for us? He turned down a side road, saying he was going to turn around, but instead of turning around, he kept driving. I banged feebly at the glass that separated us, telling him he was going the wrong way. But I was so weak, I felt very dehydrated, my mouth dry and my head spinning. I reached for the water, but I thought better of it. I didn't want anything he might give us, and as the top came off, I squeezed it against the little holes that allowed us to hear him. He jumped and cursed, turning around to glower at me as the voice from the phone came back again. You stupid bitch! I hope you keep that energy when they get you. They'll teach you some manners. My blood ran cold at that, and I let the empty water bottle fall as I looked for other options. I tried the doors, but the child locks were on, and I couldn't get it open. I started to panic. I, I kicked at the door, at the glass, but each kick was more feeble than the last. I was starting to feel like I might pass out. The cabbie laughed, telling me about all the terrible things the people he was taking me to would do, and my vision was swimming with tears. I bent over and puked in the floorboard, some of my wooziness clearing up as I purged the liquor, but it also left me feeling weak and unsteady. I banged my head against the glass as we finally came to a halt, and I went shakily to the window to see where we were. We were not miraculously in front of my apartment the whole thing a dream or a hallucination but in a vacant lot down some country back road at the end of the vacant lot perched like a gargoyle was a white van waiting for us to arrive as we sat idling the doors came open and shadowy figures started getting out i felt my blood run cold as they walked towards us stopping halfway between as if waiting for the cabbie. I thought again about my car sitting in front of Sandy's house and how I could have driven us home if I had just stayed sober. Looks like we've reached your destination, said the cabbie, turning around to flash me a big creepy grin as he slid his seatbelt off. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. And he hopped out to go talk to them. I shook Felicia, trying to wake her up, but she was a little more than dead weight. They they would get her. They would get me in my current weakened condition. I couldn't fight them off. I could barely keep my head up, and I cried bitter tears in the back of that cab. If I was lucky, maybe they'd just kill us, but I doubted it. We were both likely to end up in some overseas brothel or on the streets of South America, and either prospect was grim. The cabbie shook hands with one of the shadow people, pointing back at the cab and likely telling them he had a couple of half-drunk girls ready for transport. We were in the middle of nowhere. There was no chance anyone was coming to help us. We'd be heading wherever in no time, gone and forgotten, never to be seen again, and there was nothing we could do about it. It appeared, however, that someone had other ideas. They had started walking towards the cab when lights suddenly lit up the back glass. Cars suddenly began pulling up, vans and undercover cars, and people came out then with guns drawn. The men in the headlights of the cab put their hands up, and as they were surrounded and cuffed, they were dragged off to those vans pretty quickly. They took the men away, and that was when they seemed to realize that they had people in the back of the cab. They helped us get somewhere safe so they could get us checked out, and I'm pretty sure Felicia never woke up to the whole thing. They kept assuring us that we were okay, that we were safe, but all I could do was cry. I felt like I had been plucked from the brink at the last minute, and I thanked them with every breath I had. That was how I was almost trafficked by some gang or organization or another. The cops told us the less we knew, the better, and I agreed. I haven't drank since then, and now 
I'm a permanent designated driver for our group. I take friends of friends home, too. Sometimes intoxicated women we've met that night. Just to make sure that no one goes through what we went through. So be wary if you see a strange cabbie waiting while you're wandering home one night. You may be in for a longer trip than you bargained for. You're still here. Thanks so much for joining us for tonight's spooky tale. If you'd like a little bit more spooky in your life, why not click on one of the videos that appears at the end of our story? Or maybe head on over to one of our playlists where you can get your fill of spooky content. If you like your spooky a little more tactile, I've got a new book that's come out. If you'd like your own copy, there's a link below in the description where you can get your own copy of my spooky book. If you like what you see here on the channel and think you might like to support in a more monetized way, then why not come over to Patreon or become a member on YouTube? Speaking of, let's go ahead and thank our members now. Thanks to Siv Garstead, Unicorn Hollow, and Army Dude for being our spooky ghost contributors. Thanks to Janet, Lee Kendall, Psycat, Rhonda J, Sue Casper, and Valinator for being our spooky skeleton contributors. And thanks to O Snap, Hi Stacy, Winter, Zeronin, Stephanie Carrington, Tyler Parker, Cinnamon Fox, Grim Reaper, Tomboy Top Uwu, and Queen Sheba for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. And a big thanks to Scott Donahue for being our ghostly writer tier contributor. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. If you'd like to support the channel, then come on down to Patreon or become a member on YouTube. Spooky Skeleton tier contributors, that's our $5 tier, get their spooky 12 hours early at 8.30 a.m. as opposed to 8.30 p.m. My time, of course. And while Ghostly Reading is uh, only a tier that's available on Patreon, you get a signed copy of my book anytime I write one on your doorstep in hopefully a timely manner. If you'd like a book, we have many on Amazon. I've got links below if you'd like to follow those. Um, should get you to my page so you can buy any one of my eight books I believe we're up to now. I'm sure they'd look really nice on your shelf, and I'll sign them for you if you can find me out in the wild. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>